great, so I'm going to try not to touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have Ian touch something. So. Uh, so my name is Matt Carter. I'm executive director at the Dakota County Historical Society. Uh, I hope you had your coffee because for the next three hours. <laughs> so I get asked a lot, uh, why do I do these presentations or what got me interested? And uh, I grew up in Greensburg, Wisconsin. And as I went through school, um, we had all the social studies and history classes you have as a student and went to UW-Eau Claire and started getting into the history program. And we had to do a, a senior thesis. And part of that is I had no idea what to do, so I started looking into local history. And in doing so, I came across a Centennial book that mentioned something about a POW camp that was in Reedsburg. Never heard about it as I was going through school and uh, piqued my interest, so I started looking into it and started doing research, and I wrote my senior thesis on that. And uh, since then, that was a few years ago, uh, <laughs> since then I've been able to do a, a number of different research projects related to it. Um, I've, I do freelance stuff on the side, and I work with the Reedsburg Area Historical Society, and we put together a new exhibit for them on the POW camps. And then we just created um, a historical marker for the POW camp in Reedsburg, which is the first one that was created in the state of Wisconsin. So we're pretty fortunate to be able to do that. And uh, through those projects, I've been able to go to the National Archives and do research on the POW camp. So some of that information you'll see here as we go. And uh, with that, There's two different types of camps. So there's the internment camps and then prisoner of war camps. So this one is specifically looking at prisoner of war camps. The internment camps were for the confinement of prisoners of war, enemy aliens, uh, political prisoners, etc. So those internment camps, um, if you think about the Japanese internment camps, that would have been um, different than these POW camps. With the POW camps, um, those are strictly for the um, prisoners of war. So the enemy aliens, uh, after uh, war was declared in 1939, uh, J. Edgar Hoover was given permission to start going around and creating lists of uh, potential saboteurs or enemy aliens to the United States. The three primary categories were Italian, Japanese, and German, and in doing this, um, compilation, they created a list of about 1.1, someone vouched for them, they did not end up having to go into a permanent internment camp. They eventually went to the Topaz Internment Center, and then they were relocated to Dakota County. So in Dakota County, the Kawakami family came, and uh, they ended up living, uh, husband and wife, they ended up having a daughter while they were there, and some other children. Uh, but that was one of the other alternatives that could have happened or occurred instead of being sent to an internment camp. These two, they lived on the Branchen farm in Dakota County, and at the same time they were working there, the Branchen family, which was an 800 acre farm, also had German POWs on their property working at the same time. So it's just a, a, a unique ex opportunity, experience, neither one of those are the right words, um, but it brought them together at the same time as they had uh, German POWs working there. So as an overview of the POW camps, <coughs> Japanese soldiers that were captured by the Western Allies were generally held um, in either Australia, New Zealand, India, or the United States. German soldiers that were captured were generally held in the UK or the United States. And then all, all of the um, soldiers, specifically German, <coughs> were uh, afraid and feared being captured by the Soviet Union. So with the Soviets or the USSR as they were um, fighting these wars. Um, if you're familiar with the history, they had the Soviet, um, German Soviet non aggression pact. And with that, the Germany and as we know today as Russia decided they would be allies, not attack each other. Adolf Hitler changed his mind shortly thereafter, ended up attacking Russia, and the uh, Soviets or the Russians didn't approve of that. They weren't too happy. And so a lot of these soldiers ended up being afraid that when they were captured, there's the, the common saying of you're gonna get sent to Siberia, that was a real thing. They would send them to Siberia, they would work these hard labor camps, many of them died. 
Um, I talked to a gentleman that uh, served overseas. Um, he didn't specify which war, but he was younger, uh, so he was about 50 or 60, and he, while overseas in Germany, was talking and got to know some of the, the community there, and he talked to a gentleman that he and his brother were German POWs during the war. They were both captured. He, the gentleman that was talking specifically with the, the guy I talked to, if you can follow that, um, <laughs> he said he was held in the United States, his brother was held in Russia, and the two of them were about the same age, and the difference between them was night and day. So the German brother, um, according to the gentleman that I talked to, looked about 20 or 30 years younger. And he really said that he truly believes it was because when he was a POW, he was here in the United States. His brother was over in Russia doing all the hard labor and all the backbreaking work that they were forcing them to do. They weren't being fed as well as they were here in the United States. And because of that, that was a huge difference. Um, and then there were also the opportunities when the Soviet Union could, they would outright kill German prisoners that they were capturing. So all of that kind of led to this fear of being captured by the Soviet Union, a lot again, specifically by German soldiers. And I don't know if we'll get to it tonight, but that actually led to a number of German POWs escaping towards the end of the war because they thought they were being turned over to the Soviets at the end. So they thought their best alternative was to escape. So why the United States? And I'll, I'll also throw out there too, all of these slides, real quick summaries. So all of a sudden, we're in the middle of a war and uh, Pearl Harbor gets attacked. So each one of these slides could be about an hour long presentation on its own. So this is a very quick summary. Uh, so Pearl Harbor gets attacked. All these allied countries were running out of space. They had been in the war already for multiple years. And as the United States gets attacked, um, there's this new, new entity coming in and all this new land and a new opportunity that these prisoners could be sent to. There was a fear of a German uprising. There were rumors going around that all of these uh, POW camps, that were the Allied camps holding German prisoners, they were afraid that Adolf Hitler was going to come in and they were going to drop weapons into these camps. And the German soldiers were gonna get them and have an uprising from within. And then from there, they would take over the camp and it would continue to snowball from there. So they thought there's a new opportunity, this new country's joining, we'll send them further away. And for the United States, the benefit to them was it gave them a new labor force. So by the number, again, these are estimates, um, these are numbers in the millions. So the USSR, a little over 12 million, same as the United States, Germany, Japan, and so on. These are not all of the countries that served or participated in the war. These are some of those major countries that you think of. Uh, as we find out with the United States, most of the prisoners that come over are captured as part of the Africa Corps. So they're down in Africa fighting, and as they get captured, they then get sent over to the United States. But there's nothing up here to even represent that through this chart. So this truly was a global war. So as I mentioned, there are about 12 million men and women that went off to serve in some sort of military capacity. Again, I grew up in Reedsburg, so this is a um, newspaper article talking about a Reedsburg girl that was called into service and she joined the WAC. Um, as these men and women are leaving, there's these giant um, shortages on the, the home front, and the agriculture was hit extremely hard. For a while, there was an exemption, but eventually that exemption ends in those uh, men and women, uh, mostly men in those industries, then have to join the, the military. And POWs were able to be used to offset that labor shortage. In the United States, uh, the United States as a whole was divided into uh, nine service commands. So the six service command included uh, <coughs> Illinois, which Chicago was the headquarters, um, Wisconsin and Michigan, and then the seventh service command was Colorado, Iowa, Kansas, Minnesota, Wyoming, Missouri, Nebraska, North Dakota, and South Dakota, and Omaha was the headquarters for that. So to kind of show the map here, um, the first service command is up here, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, and ninth. 
So that's how the United States was essentially divided out into service commands. And this played an important role in the reporting and documentation that was going forward once the prisoners got here. So some of those reports look like this, which I know everyone in the back of the room can see perfectly fine. <laughs> so this is a need for year-round POW labor. So this document here breaks it down by service command, one through nine. And if you remember, the sixth service command would have been about the Wisconsin, seventh service command is um, yeah. what Minnesota was eventually included in. So this is basically saying these are how many POWs we believe we're going to need at this time to offset the labor shortage that we're experiencing within the each state, which was then, in this case, compiled into an overall service command. So the Seventh Service Command, they thought they'd need about uh, 19,758 POWs year-round to help with various aspects. Nothing in March or April, then you get into um, about, or I'm sorry, nothing in March, April, and then you get into May, you need about 12,000 POWs. And then as you get over into July, August, September, that number jumps up to 20,000 um, and then 24,000. So when you think about the harvest, because agriculture was hit the hardest, that's when in those summer months, they would need to have most of that POW labor come in. Other reports like this one, this is the need by service command uh, for food processing by state. So that other one was year round labor needed. This one here is by state, and this is specifically in the food processing industry. So this one is nice because under the seventh service command, it breaks it down by state. Not all of them did, some of them did like this. So here, if you find Minnesota on the seventh service command, you can see that each one of them is outlining how many POWs that they're going to need. If you can see in the back, there are some small letters that are hard to see when you're up front, so I don't know how you'd see them back there. Uh, but each letter has a different indication. So if there is an A next to it, they were used for P's. So if you look at Minnesota, they're looking at uh, B. Or I'm sorry, Minnesota started at A, and then eventually they switched to C. So A was P, B was vegetables, C was corn, D was tomatoes, and E was fruit. So they saw what you had here in Long. That would be a smaller camp, so base camps could be you know, five to 15,000 prisoners. The branch camps are the smaller camps that you know, are generally 100 to 500. Um, some go a little higher, some go a little lower, but they're also not very high security. Camp Reedsburg, where I grew up, <coughs> looking through the newspaper, they were complaining about these Nazis that were gonna be coming in, and there's no plan for security. So the camp decides, we're gonna secure us, so they put up a snow fence. <laughs> and the snow fence was the order that they had to keep these prisoners in. And so again, these, these branch camps were not high security, but they also, for the most part, didn't really have that, that sense of danger or that these prisoners were going to try and escape. Nazi prisoners, as they came in, were usually separated. Most of them, if they were at a branch camp, there were only one or two of them. They tried to keep the numbers low. If there were more, they would have been at the base camps kept separate. So Camp McCoy had a whole separate section that they had Nazi prisoners in. And that's, again, the hardcore following Nazis, not just a general German soldier. According to the 1929 Geneva Convention, we had to follow the, um, the, Conve the Geneva Convention. Uh, so whatever we offered at our base camps, we had to offer from our soldiers what we offered to German prisoners or just prisoners in general. So if we offered, not that we did, air conditioning and heat, that would have had to have been offered to them as well. So there were certain requirements we had to follow according to the Geneva Convention. <coughs> One of those uh, requirements was if we had them work, we had to pay them. So the prisoners, while they were here, were being paid for the work they were doing. They'd be paid in uh, chits or sprit. And what that would be is you could work for 10 cents an hour up to 80 cents per day. That money you could then go back to your canteen and buy goods and supplies with. If you didn't buy anything and you wanted to save it, as you came over that treasury account that was created, you could put that money into that account. At the end of the war, whatever you put in there and saved, you could take back with you. 
in addition to whatever you had in there when you got here. So with that, again, they were able to save it. This is a picture just showing some of the prisoners at the, uh, I believe it's Clifford, is it Jeske? Good, you all passed. Um, <laughs> they were working out there on his farm. Um, this was published in the book, Swords into Plowshares. So if you're not familiar with it, that is one of two books that was written about the Minnesota experience for prisoners of war. The other one was called Behind Barbed Wire. And as this shows, there were a number of photos included that actually came from the Brown County Historical Society's collection that was included in this book. So again, another kind of hard to see document. This is the pay rate for prisoners of war for commissioned officers. So German lieutenants and Italian were paid 20 per month, captains were paid 30, and then all other commissioned officers were paid 40. As a high-ranking official, you would not have to work. Some records show that a lot of them chose to because it gave them something to do to pass the time, and generally when they did, they were supervising the work details. One thing on here is the Japanese are crossed off. I get asked the why a lot, and I've never seen a definitive answer to explain why they're crossed off. What I can say is a lot of the work details that went out were Italian and German. Most of them were not including any Japanese prisoners. Most of them were held in the camp. If they did do any detail work, um, at least in Minnesota and Wisconsin, I haven't seen it. At Camp McCoy in Wisconsin, so as you're driving the Everyone says as you're driving through Wisconsin, you always run out of gas around Toma. Um, so if you do, you end up going and you see a sign right there for Camp McCoy. If you go to Camp McCoy, they're actually looking at redoing all of their interpretation on the POWs to try and include more on the Japanese. Um, if they did any uh, detail at Camp McCoy, they generally did it within the confines of the camp. They didn't send them out into the community to work. Some of that was because um, the Japanese had a different uh, honor system within the military. They thought it was a disgrace to be captured. Um, so some records indicate that they would try and escape a lot. And it was um, kind of a danger to themselves because, again, here in New Ulm, a German prisoner escaping, the only way they would stand out is the PW that's on the back of their clothes. A Japanese prisoner would stand out right away. So it was a danger to them, but also a danger potentially to the community because they would try to escape quite frequently and they did escape from Camp McCoy quite a bit. Um, with that, uh, that may be some, somewhat of an explanation, but I'm sure there's other reasons why at the same time. They were fed in the camps. This is a sample menu from uh, McDill Field in Florida from January 1945. So I'm, I don't usually read through a lot of these, but I'm gonna read through this one. So for breakfast on January 1st, 1945, they had pineapple juice, whole wheat cereal, fresh milk, French toast, butter, syrup, coffee. For dinner, they had roast turkey and dressing, giblet gravy, mashed potatoes, string beans, fruit salad, bread, butter, ice cream, cake, and coffee. For supper, they had vegetable soup, assorted cold cut, sliced cheese, potato salad, celery and olives, bread, butter, chocolate pudding, and coffee. <laughs> so that's a sample menu. <laughs> One of the things we, this would have most likely been at uh, McDill, I believe, was also a, a base camp. Um, one of the, the um, when I did the presentation at one point, someone said, well, how do we know they were fed that? We don't. The thought was, well, maybe they were fed that, but they also may have been, um, if there were any complaints that were made, they would go through Switzerland. They were the go-between. So any complaints the U.S. had about Germany or Germany about U.S., they would go to Switzerland and relay the information. So a lot of times there were investigations that were done, and someone floated the idea, well, maybe they knew there was an investigation coming, and they said, here's what we feed our prisoners. We're not mistreating them. We're feeding them well. We don't know. The only thing we know is this was a sample menu that was included with the uh, records at the National Archives for uh, McDill Field in Florida. But it makes for an entertaining read um, just to see what that menu is. 
there was a lot of public outcry. So according to the Geneva Convention, you did have to feed the prisoners a certain amount of calories per day. Prisoners were required to eat, if they were sedentary, 2,500 calories, doing moderate work, 3,000 calories, and if they were very active, 4,500 calories. If you look back at McDill Field, that was probably pushing 4,500 calories. Mm -hmm. uh, but according to the New Orleans Camp Commander, uh, Charles Lawyer, he did a presentation for the local Rotary Club, and he stated, because there was a question on how were they being fed, and he stated that they were being fed about 3,400 calories per day at Camp New Orleans. He said that they were getting a warm breakfast, sandwiches and coffee for lunch, and then when they returned back home to the camp, they were having a warm meal that was ready for them there. Now, all of this was in the media. Newspapers presented on this quite frequently. They have articles all the time talking about local camps, um, which made it kind of hard for some people, like in Reedsburg. Um, I spoke to a woman who said she was a teenager at the time and had no idea there was a camp in Reedsburg and she lived about 10 miles away. But it was reported on in the newspaper. So I guess if you've read the newspaper, you could see it. Um, but they also talked about how all these soldiers are returning home um, back to America, and they have all these experiences of being mistreated while they were overseas as a prisoner. So once this starts coming back, there's a lot of public outcry that we're coddling all these German prisoners that are here in the United States. There were a lot of changes that were eventually made, um, and I think we'll talk about a few of those here in a couple of slides. So for their camp life, they had to staff most of their own buildings, so um, the canteens where you could buy the goods, but also the kitchens, you had to have your own cook. Um, it was not uncommon for soldiers to be able to buy soda, beer, cigarettes, candy, and other luxury items in 1944. As the public outcry happens, and these camps start to, they close in 44 and start to reopen in 45, they no longer provide those luxury items. So Camp New Wong, again, Commander Charles Lawyer during another Rotary Club presentation, he said that they are not providing cigarettes for their, their POWs. Instead, they have to buy their own tobacco and roll their own cigarettes. So each morning, they had a routine they had to follow, and then during their downtime, they could use it for personal use. So a lot of camps, soccer was played, cards. Um, depending on the camp, some of them had their own billiards tables. Um, so they had their own downtime that they could kind of do what they want with. This here is not a, it's a, a, not a POW camp, it's an internment camp. So this is a schedule for the Appian internment camp that was at Camp McCoy in Wisconsin. So they'd wake up at first call at 545, they'd have breakfast, and then their whole day was kind of structured for how that was going to look. And then at the end of the day, at 11 p.m., they would play taps. And that would mean all the lights had to be out, you had to be in bed sleeping. So POWs would have had a similar schedule, but instead, they would wake up, have their breakfast, and then get ready to go out for work detail. During their downtime, these are from the um, UW Lacrosse collection. So POWs were able to attend mass. They could play soccer. Um, they also had classes they could take. If there was a POW camp near a university, some universities would send in um, educators or professors, and they would teach classes for the um, community or the prisoner, the prison community. Um, otherwise, they had what they called the reorientation program. So that was basically to come in and create a program where you educate the prisoners on what it was like to be an American in a democracy. So they would let them read, teach them to read, write, speak English, they'd let them watch movies, listen to the radio, they'd be able to read the newspapers. And the idea was they were reorientating these prisoners. So they come here, they learn about democracy, and they go back home and say, hey, it wasn't that bad and they try and spread the democracy through Germany once they return. So as the war draws to an end, there was a special memo that was sent on April 18th, 1945, to all the camp commanders saying basically, the war's coming to an end, we don't know when, but we sense it's coming close, and you need to start preparing. So they started to increase security, <laughs> they had specially trained dogs they brought in, because they didn't know how these German prisoners were gonna handle the news that they lost the war. 
So as that happens, they increase security. They have, uh, on May 8th, the E-Day, the official surrender of Germany, and there was a letter that was sent that all camp commanders had to read to the prisoners. So they brought them into probably the mess hall, had them sit there, and this is a sample of what the, the, the camp commander would have to read. So you would say, to the German prisoners of war at Camp Nuon. And this is just part of what that is. Today, all organized resistance to allied armies in Germany ceased. That event marks the destruction of Nazism. To those German prisoners of war with hands clean of crimes under the law of war, you may expect to return to their homeland in due course. It will not be soon, but when conditions permit, you will be repatriated. You will continue to be interned at prisoner of war camps. You should not attempt to escape because you will surely be captured and return to face disciplinary action. You will find the American people hostile to you. Many of them have lost friends and relatives in the struggle to destroy Nazi tyranny and can be expected to deal harshly with you if they find you outside military control. So this was read to all these prisoners as they sit there. And there's a couple of things in here that are key. So one is, um, you will not return home soon. So there were a number of prisoners of war that were kept here through 1946 and some even into 1947 after the war ended. There was a, po a process that was done for repatriation and it took a long time to move through and get these prisoners repatriated. It also was do not try and escape. But as I said before, as the war drew to an end, the German prisoners thought they were going to be turned over to the Soviets, so a lot of them, when they did escape, used this as an opportunity. Uh, there's one gentleman, and I won't tell a, a whole bunch of stories, but my favorite one is George Gardner. He was held at a POW camp, and he found out that the war was coming to an end, and he thought he was getting turned over to the Soviets. So as he was getting ready, he planned his escape. He timed the train schedule that was driving, going by his camp. So he tracked when the trains were going by, and he started collecting supplies. So at night, when this train goes by, he escapes under the fence, jumps onto the back of a moving train, and is taken away. That was in 1945. So George eventually makes his way west, and he starts working as a ski instructor under an assumed name. So he's a ski instructor. He joined a local moose lodge and got really embedded into the community. Uh, as a ski instructor, there was a group that was going through the Donner Pass that got stuck. And he was one of those that led or helped out on the expedition to rescue them. Time, uh, Time News did a huge story on this. No idea he was in that group. The FBI wanted posters for him, kind of expired. Um, and uh, George was going to get remarried. Um, and the person he was going to marry had a daughter, and his, the daughter and her, the mom, would always ask him questions and he would dodge them. You know? So they finally said well, who he was going to marry. His fiance said, if you don't tell me what you're hiding, we're not going to go through with this. So he confesses he's a former prisoner of war that escaped, and he's been living under an assumed identity. <laughs> And she said, you need to do something about this. So he decided to contact a historian, and they wrote a book. So the book is called Hitler's Last Soldier in America, and it's all about his experience. Now, if you want to watch the video when he turns himself in, in 1985, he lived for 40 years without this, and he turns himself in on the Today Show. So you can Google it, and you can find the clip when he turns himself in. Um, and the FBI said, well, we don't really care because <laughs> this was 40 years ago, so they didn't care. Immigration said, we don't care because everyone was repatriated. And, uh, and the estimate is about 5,000 German prisoners came back to the United States to live permanently because they enjoyed their time here so much. So they said, we don't care. So basically, they let him go, and he eventually got his citizenship um, uh, just, like, I believe, it was a couple of years before he died. So again, that, that's one of the opportunities that people, when they were fearing that they were going to be sent to the uh, Soviets, they took that as an opportunity to escape. So they, as the war is drawing to an end, 
they decide that they're going to increase this reorientation program and start trying to teach them. Now the downside of this is they taught them how to read, write, and speak English, so when they escaped, they knew how to speak English. <laughs> so as these camps begin to close, this is an example of the executive orders that are sent in. So general orders number 137, this was sent into the Sixth Service Command on August 11th, 1945, talking about the prisoner of war camps in Door County, Wisconsin, so Sturgeon Bay and Sister Bay in Fish Creek. These camps are now ordered to start closing. They're going to close on a specific day, which this one, um, August 15th. So what they would have to do is they start to inventory all the equipment and everything that's in the government. 1944, December, that number's 359,000. With, um, so November, there were 24,000 additional prisoners that arrived coming up to that total of 359. And then in 1945, that number is about 365,000. So when you take into account the number that are arriving and departing, that gets very confusing, but also why there's essentially only estimates of about 425,000. There was one document I saw that estimated that it was closer to 600,000. But most of them try and stick around that 425 to 450,000 range. This document shows the availability for prisoners of war from June 1943 to 1945. So this shows the total thousands of prisoners that are available by month and year. So this shows in April 1945, there were about 350,000 total prisoners available for work here in the United States. This shows the total number of man days worked. And so this is the, in the millions, not the thousands, the millions. So here in March 1945, there's about 5.5 million day, man days that were worked by POWs here in the United States. And all of that was done to help offset that labor shortage. At the same time, they were being paid. So as an entity that was using POWs, you would have to pay the treasury prevailing wages. So whatever the prevailing wage was, you had to pay that. And then the government took that money and paid out 10 cents per hour to the soldiers that were working. <coughs> and then that's how the government was able to fund these different camps and locations throughout the country. This was the collections from contract work. So here, about <coughs> December of 1944, going into 45, they collected almost $4 million that month for the work that was being done by the POWs. So Minnesota had POW camps, as you know. Um, this is a map in a, a kind of a location um, of where those camps were. That map comes from the, uh, uh, the book uh, Swords and uh, Plowshares. Or I'm sorry, this one actually came from behind door barbed wire. Uh, there's also a similar map that's in the other book. So here in Minnesota, it was actually a grassroots effort that was created to start coming up with um, ways to offset that labor shortage. So in 1943, the Minnesota Farm <coughs> Health Coordinating Committee met and discussed that there were emergency needs to bring in workers to help with the agriculture. And they created a report that outlined an 11 point <coughs> plan and that had items included such as um, exemptions for agriculture workers from war, Cease to cease recruiting farmers for individual or industrial jobs so that they can stay in the agricultural um, field. And then by uh, February 1944, there's a report that stated that the Minnesota Canners Association needed at least 3,000 workers just in the canning industry for the state of Minnesota. So Minnesota starts to accept war prisoners. So the War Manpower Commission, the War Production Board, and the War Food Administration all worked together to help create this um, process that was in place to get prisoners. Um, a lot of the prisoners were used in agriculture because there was no unions. When these different entities were being um, selected for um, obtaining prisoners of war, a lot of unions were complaining that they were trying to hire them because they're cheaper. So as a business, if you were trying to get prisoners of war, 
a lot of times you had to show you made every effort possible to hire local American workers first. And if you couldn't, then you could proceed with hiring um, outside workers. So here in Minnesota, we used what um, was called the Bracero program. So this area utilized a number of Mexican workers that came up. They would also hire Jamaican workers. Um, There's some places that would go through the Bahamas to bring workers up, essentially trying to figure out different ways to bring in um, people just to fill the labor shortage. So again, according to the Geneva Conventions, they had to have similar standards for the military for these prisoners of war. So the Provost Marshal General started submitting plans that they were trying to reutilize civilian conservation corps camps or the local fairgrounds any auditorium that was empty, um, they were trying to repurpose those. Now in Greensburg, that branch camp was basically a tent city. So they would use military tents that were set up, that's where they lived for three months, and then they were gone. So again, this is where they were located by year, as well as how many prisoners of war they had at that time during that year. So the Princeton camp was the first camp in Minnesota to receive prisoners. They received them on September 1st, 1943, and they brought them in, and some of these prisoners were also split between the Olivia camp. There were 100 Italian um, that were captured in North Africa, and they arrived with 40 uh, military guards, or military police to act as guards. They were brought to the depot on a special train, and then marched to the trucks, and then from the trucks they went um, to the farm they were working on, and that's where they then stayed in the camp that was established. These camps, for the most part in Minnesota, they were provided food that was sent daily from uh, Fort Snelling. Other times they had local camp cooks that were providing food as well. So if you were a prisoner and you went out to a farm or to a canning industry, a uh, bad example, if you went to the canning factory or any factory, you would bring a lunch with you. If you went to a farm, most of the farm families fed the prisoners, even though they weren't supposed to. Some stories I've heard of people that were uh, younger at the time, living on a farm that had prisoners of war, said that their uh, moms would, or their mother would say, if we're going to eat, they're gonna eat with us, otherwise no one eats. And that was a pretty good um, convincing point to the prison guards that wanted to eat that food as well. So it wasn't uncommon to see a group of prisoners sitting at the dinner table with the family eating together either before or after a shift was done. And again, you weren't supposed to, but it happened all the time. Uh, Camp Moorhead, unfortunately, had um, they had about 40 prisoners that arrived in May of 1944. Um, unfortunately, death did occur. So this one talks about a drowning that took place as they were swimming, um, and a lot of times, so some of them were buried at local cemeteries. Other times they were sent back home overseas. Um, there's a few examples where they were buried here at the end of the war, they were then repatriated and sent back overseas after the war ended. Camp Farrell had about 200 German prisoners of war that were there, and they worked within a 25 mile radius. They were held in barracks at uh, Russell Square. Uh, in Dakota County, we didn't have a camp, but we did utilize prisoners of war from Farrell that were bussed up every day. Um, if you're familiar in Hastings, there's Shars Bluff. It's a, a park. Um, the Shar family would drive a school bus down every day, pick them up, drive it back, they'd work, and then at the end of the day, drive them back on the bus and he'd come back home. Uh, one night on the way back, uh, they ended up going off the road and crashing. And as they crashed, one of the prisoners broke a collarbone um, and three of them in total had to be sent to uh, Fort Snelling for medical attention. Um, they did the police investigation. All of the prisoners um, essentially signed an affidavit that said it was not his fault. They stood up for him, um, and, and again, that shows the close relationship they had with these prisoners and most of the people they were working with. So when they did that, they found out a tie rod broke, and that's what made them go off the road and crash. So Camp New Ulm. So this is a sketch that was done by a German POW, and in the book they talk about how there were a number of POWs. This guy here um, made a bunch of sketches and actually made a bunch of paintings that he then gave to um, 
people that worked at the, the factory. And we were just talking earlier, this here is one of the paintings that was done by a German POW um, that, and I, if you, I don't know if you want to say anything about it real quick? Yeah, it's a, a, it was done by a POW that worked at Oaks Brick and Tile in Springfield. So that wasn't planned at all, but a very nice coincidence that I had actually included one of these sketch drawings. So over here at Camp New Ulm, the first prisoners arrived in 1944 and were primarily brought in to help with the shortage in the canning industry. And there were about 150 that were brought in, again, specifically the Sleepy Eye canning plant. Um, and this was a year-round camp that was located at the time at Cottonwood State Park, uh, now named, and I'm going to say it wrong, uh, Landra. I saw a lot of heads going up and down, so that's good. Um, and as you all know, this was a very heavily um, German ethnic area. And there were reports in the books and, and other documents that said a lot of the prisoners were really surprised when they're out working and they hear other people speaking German around them. And a lot of that, and again in Reedsburg, we had a very um, heavy German population. A lot of them spoke German. The, the camp in uh, Reedsburg was in kind of a, a below a bluff, and there was a gentleman I talked to that lived on the bluff. And he and his family every Sunday would sit on the bluff on their porch and listen to the prisoners sing their church songs. And their par his parents could speak German, so they were able to understand everything they were singing and even sing along with them. Um, they also watched them play soccer, in, in I think he even said volleyball at one point. Uh, but while they were here, they were actually working in a number of different industries, and uh, um, canning was one of them, but they also worked in the fields. As mentioned, they worked in the brick and tile industry, um, so they were primarily brought over for canning, but they worked in all different industries while they were here during that time. They did have a record-setting year. So at the end of 1944, in the summer, there was a lot of information talking about how these prisoners were out able to fish and they were able to swim. And then in the winter, they were able to build their own skis and their own skates that they could utilize during their downtime. But from 1944 into 45, the production was going up and the demand for prisoners skyrocketed. So at this point, this is an article that talks about how the canning was be just beginning. And by the end of 1945, they had actually set a record for the pea pack that was happening in the, the area. And they actually had so much that was being harvested, they, the newspapers talked about how they were actually debating whether or not they were gonna send it out to their competitors so it didn't go rotten. Now, unfortunately, they did have about 3,000 um, 3, packs of peas that were spoiled because it just sat there. So that just shows how much they were able to do at that point. Um, but also, there were eight other counties nearby that were now submitting requests to use these prisoners because the demand for them was so high. So these are just some images from the camp, and I believe these are all from the book, and most of these are actually, again, here in the Brown County Historical Society collection. This is actually a set of twins, uh, Hans and, and Warner. Um, I know I didn't pronounce it the correct German way, but um, they were here at Camp New Ulm, and this is a picture that was in Behind Barbed Wire, but also in the book here for um, the plows and the, uh, no, swords and the plowshares. So between these books and a number of other documents, there were all, all these stories that were shared, and I know a bunch of you probably have your own, but some of them were how um, the German church services, so pastors or ministers, were able to go into this camp and they were able to provide church services, both Lutheran and Catholic, for the prisoners in German. Uh, Herman Schaefer was hiking with a friend near a camp and he, they stopped to fry eggs. And while they did that, all of a sudden German prisoners came up to them and said, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> and they said, here's how you do a German egg. And they sat down and they talked and they cooked these eggs together. Again, these two, these boys that are sitting there along the river, and there are stories all the time of um, people, and again, 
stereotyping. A lot of them are young boys that are fishing and playing along the river, and these German prisoners just kind of walk up and happen upon them. Um, in Reedsburg, the camp they had was on water. It was on a river with the snow fence. Um, and it wasn't uncommon for them to go swimming in the water and just have general public sitting there swimming or fishing at the same time. So very few prisoners would stay in a location very long. Uh, most of the camps were set up for the harvest and then they were gone. Now here at Camp Nuwong, that was different. Um, generally, they would come to help the branch camp and then they would move on. Once the work was done, they'd go back to either a different branch camp or they would go to the, um, the base camp. So in this, um, Commander Boyer again, uh, presented to a Kiwanis club. He did a lot of presentations. Um, and the newspaper was more than happy to publish those presentations. Uh, at the end of the, the stay here at Camp Nuom, he said that the Nazis in the camp still believed that they were the superior race, but he said overall in general, most of the prisoners um, were good prisoners, they were hard workers, and they showed little inclination to escape. Um, camp Nuom was open for one and a half years continuously. They weren't open for those short three month spurts and then closed, they were open year round. Um, and the only camps that outlived them, so Camp Nuong closed in December of 1945, and the only ones that lasted longer were Deer River and Owatonna. So once they were sent home, most of them, again, 5,000 came back to live, but a lot of them on the anniversaries of World War II ending would come back to visit. So. This is an example of a group, um, that gentleman was a POW at the uh, Farmington location in Dakota County. On the 50th anniversary, he came back with his friend and uh, they returned back to um, talk with the people that were uh, still around at the, the farm they had worked on. Um, this wasn't new, it happened a lot. There's one gentleman that came back from New Ulm. He lived in Bemidji for a while, would come back to visit New Ulm on occasion and eventually he moved down to Kenosha, Wisconsin. So with that, are there any questions? Yeah. You bring back a lot of memories for me. Well, hopefully they're good. <laughs> I, uh, I was a senior in high school in 1944 and worked part time for the Eisner Bakery. And almost daily I would drive to our van out there with a bakery because I could speak German, I visited with them. And I got to know them pretty good. Uh, that camp, by the way, was built in the 1930s for the CCC camp. Uh, and it had no fence around it, and they didn't have any fence around it. And many of them came to town at night. <laughs> there was a shortage of men in the wall. <laughs> talked about them coming into New Ulm and they saw a sign for beer and they got excited. So <laughs> that would make sense then. They also worked at American Art Show in Campbell, which was a, uh, a stone thing similar to uh, brick making. And they also worked at the New Ulm Brick Company Art Show. When they worked, they looked forward to harvest time. Back then, uh, the harvest thing and farming was, didn't have the technology we have today, the mechanization. And they would uh, do the by hand, dock, uh, drain dock and so on. They look forward to that big fancy dinner that the, the, the ladies made at, at the farm thing. So farm, uh, that month of August was really an important one for them. No, I'm glad you corroborated the story about them eating with the families. So, uh, But no, I, I mean, there's a number of stories I've heard talking about how it wasn't uncommon at the local tavern to see prisoners down there drinking or having a, a meal or something. Uh, some. Some farm families, they had a little more leeway. They would use that as an incentive. Of on the way back to the camp, if, if you do good work, we'll stop and you can have a beer or you might get some extra cigarettes on the way. So it wasn't uncommon to see them out and about town. And I know there's one story of a gentleman that was a, an American prisoner of war in Germany that came back and went down to a local tavern and there was a, a, a guard with two German prisoners and he didn't take that well because he had been a prisoner over in Germany and was treated a whole lot differently than he than they were treating the German prisoners. I have one. I'm Rendell County Historical Society, so for my Florida Fairgrounds, um, I have one of my members that has memories of her mom taking her as a child to go see the prisoners at the fairgrounds and they treated her like a princess. <laughs> I just, I got pictures and 
Yeah, no, and that's, there's, again, tons of stories like that. And there was one woman I interviewed who was a teenager during World War II, and she worked at the local canning factory, and she said anytime she went up to get a drink of water, all the German POWs stepped aside so she could get her drink, and then they'd go back in line. And she only had one incident that, um, and it was the final straw, uh, she had one incident and one incident only where she was walking home at night and she heard footsteps behind her and so she started walking faster and then they started walking faster and she said the good thing was I ran track so I ran all the way home and she said I got home and dad took me down to the police station to report it and that was the last day I worked there and it was an American guard. It wasn't even a German prisoner and there's actually a, a, a newspaper article where they talked where they interviewed the camp commander here and he said there were three issues. One was the American civilians always coming down to the camp when they aren't supposed to. <laughs> the second issue is the uh, American guards. And then the last issue is then when the German prisoners were the, the out of that list, they were the third, the number three in that entire thing. The other two were civilians and the guards themselves. Do you have any feel for the age of the prisoners? So they were, they were younger. Most of them were, um, and I don't know the average, um, but based on people I've talked to, they've all said from what they could remember, they're usually from you know 18 to 25. There was one guy I talked to who was a kid at the time, rode his bike down because he had to see what these Nazis looked like, because he wanted to see their horns. So he had been hearing all these stories about how they were equated to the devil. So he assumed he was going to get there and see that they had horns. Oh. And he said the craziest thing was when he got there and the train pulled up and he could see them, he said they were young young boys. He said most of them were 18 to 20 years old. And they were just being brought in on a train into the middle of Wisconsin and forced to, to work. But again, he said most of them enjoyed their time here. And it was better than the alternative of being on the front lines or um, having to deal with what was going on internally within Germany. Anything else? All right, I will turn it back over to whoever wants to. So many of us can relate to the stories that we heard from our parents and grandparents on the POW camp. <coughs> Here in Brown County. Um, with that, unless there's questions or comments or anybody else wants to say something, I think we're done for the day. And um, I don't know. Thanks for coming, and we'll see you next year. Thank you.